All right, guys, bear with us. We're, uh, we're almost done with the day. I want to thank you, uh, thank you all for hanging in there. As you know, storage has been, uh, uh, storage was the hot topic last year inside of, uh, inside of this summit and the foundation. Um, next, we've got a, a speaker who, uh, who comes from a company that's had a long history with Open Compute. We're really happy to have him. Please help me welcome Tom Layden, the Director of Product Marketing for uh, Data Direct Networks. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Layden. I do product marketing for Data Direct Networks. Uh, the product that I work on is called uh, WAS, Web Object Scalar. Uh, I'm here to explain you how a proprietary software vendor can help the open compute uh, community to be more efficient in building uh, scale-out object storage, and at the same time, how we leverage OCP to make our scale-out storage better, more efficient, and uh, easier uh, to use for our customers. So just quickly, a uh, couple of uh, details about DDN. DDN has been around for about 15 years. We're a California-based company, but we're active worldwide. Our history is uh, mostly HPC. Uh, eight out of 10 supercomputers are powered by uh, DDN uh, storage. Uh, not bad, huh? Uh, and because of that, we have some experience in scalability and performance, um, even beyond what is today uh, used in, in uh, web and, uh, scale out web applications. But you guys are catching up with the HPC, and that's what making, uh, that is what is making this conference so interesting for us. So we have been an OCP member since uh, early 2012. We're very proud of that. And we've got a couple of announcements to make here uh, in this session uh, that will show our commitment uh, to this organization. So very quickly, DDN's uh, product portfolio. It's not all about object storage, but it soon will be. Uh, we have uh, a series of block and file scale out storage platforms, uh, mostly GPFS and Lustre based. Uh, we're very experienced in that. Uh, we also have analytics infrastructures, but we've understood uh, over the past few years that the future is really object storage, especially for unstructured data. A couple of our customers, as I said, eight out of 10 supercomputers run on DDN hardware. So HPC has been very much our focus over the past 15 years. The last five years, we've more and more been working on uh, what we call web and cloud, um, scale out web applications, what probably most of you guys are working on. And apart from that, we're also very active in professional media and uh, government accounts. So let's start with a little bit of history um, about WAS. WAS was first designed in 2008. And back then, DDN was one of the first companies to, um, to understand that the feature of unstructured data, the main characteristic of unstructured data to leverage to build scale out object storage platforms was the fact that more than 80% of all unstructured data that is being generated is generated to never be changed again. It's immutable data, mostly. Okay? And as I said, we have a lot of experience building scale out file system uh, storage, file storage. Um, and what we've learned from that is to scale out, when you scale out file systems, uh, your TCO goes up. You cannot stop that. We are trying to keep our TCO okay for our file system platforms, but because of how complex it is to scale out file systems, when you have to go into the tens, hundreds of petabytes towards the exabyte, it's, you cannot avoid that a TCO goes up. And because we recognize that most of the data, the unstructured data that you're storing is, is uh, immutable, what we thought of back then was, hey, the file system is mostly there for the locking mechanisms for people to collaborate on the same data sets without making that data corrupt by collaborating on it at the same time. But if that data is never changed, we don't need those locking mechanisms. So that is really the key value of WAS object storage. It's the only object storage platform that does not have any file, uh, file system, any file locking mechanisms anywhere in the architecture. It's the purest object storage uh, product you that you can find on the market. The application talks dir directly to the object on the disk level without any file system in between. So in the first three years, we focused very much on scalability, performance, reliability, uh, all of the, the core features in WAS. And since 2011, we've been adding very cool features like a range of data protection mechanisms. We, uh, I'm going to talk more about that later on. 
Um, we've been adding very cool search technology. So we're also uh, the only object storage platform that stores the metadata in the back end w uh, with the objects. We store the metadata in what we call a key value store. And as we scale out our platform into the hundreds of petabytes, our customers can still search that data in a very efficient way. It's really cool stuff. I'm not supposed to talk about it here, but I really love it. So you can really search 100, 200, 300 petabyte of unstructured information in a matter of minutes because we can run those parallel uh, backend search uh, all together in the backend. Really cool. And then some other cool features that we've been building in uh, later on is, uh, for example, an interface to the GPFS. Uh, scale-out uh, platforms that we have. Uh, this is very hot in the uh, HPC environment. Just to say, our object storage is being used in HPC by, by, by companies who run the biggest supercomputers. That is how scalable, how efficient, how fast we can make object storage. So that is one fairy tale that we have to forget. Object storage is not just slow storage. It can be as fast as it needs to be. And that's very important for web and scale-out applications, where IOPS and throughputs can be very important for the end users. OK. So I, um, in one of the sessions yesterday um, by Facebook, uh, I heard that the two main requirements for the infrastructure, uh, according to Facebook, are uh, flexibility uh, and efficiency. And when we designed WAS, we looked at five key requirements, and efficiency is one of them. And if you combine all five requirements, being scalability, accessibility, efficiency, as I said, reliability, and performance, we aim to al allow our customers to optimize for any choice of requirements that is important for them. And that is flexibility. So we were very happy to hear Facebook say that flexibility rules when you're designing your object storage, uh, when you're designing your infrastructure, and in this case, object storage. So for example, when we have a customer who wants to build an online archive where cost efficiency, so low cost, is very important, they can set up their architecture in such a way, choose the right data protection schemes to get to the lowest cost. They may have less performance than what a scale-out web application has. But when you're serving billion, well, yeah, potentially billions of users worldwide, efficiency is probably going to be less important than what it is for, uh, for archives. And you're going to focus much more in, on getting those IOPS, the throughput, and the low latency that you would be needing for such an application. The cool thing is that we enable our customers to build all sorts of applications with different requirements all on the same platform. So you can just run one object storage platform with three, four different use cases, each with different focus uh, requirements. And that is the flexibility that Facebook was talking about. All right. So a couple of the key features in WAS that enable um, the requirements that we're just saying. So we scale seamlessly a number of objects and total capacity. Today, when you, want to when you want to deploy a WAS, you can scale up to one exabyte. That is proven. We will go beyond that in the future. We don't see a need for that right now. Uh, we offer the widest choice of protocols and a rich application ecosystem. More about that later on. Uh, we aim to provide the highest efficiency, and that is through the flexibility. So if you really need a very cost-efficient storage platform, you can do that. We don't, need, we don't do any bandwidth abuse to do um, data reconstructs. Um, and we provide all-round data protection. So a little bit more uh, about that right now. Data protection. There are a couple of object storage platforms out there that are very, very heavily focused on what they call distributed erasure coding. It's an alternative technology to, towards RAID. It's becoming very popular. We think it's a very cool idea, but uh, that our focus when designing was was mostly in building that no file system object storage platform. So in the first version of was, we basically only did um, replication, okay, three three way replication. We thought it was very reliable, and it is very reliable. Over time, we decided to add um, our our form of erasure coding, which is called object assure. Then we decided to add replicated object assure, which allows you to do local erasure coding in just one data center and then make a replica in a different data center. And uh, in, the, in the new release of PAUSE later this quarter, we will also make the distributed erasure coding available. Now, what's so cool about having all those data protection uh, mechanisms? Well, just because you can optimize towards your performance, towards your efficiency. If you need high performance, low, uh, high throughput, low latency, you'll typically choose to make the different replicas of your data. Um, if you want to um, optimize uh, towards low overhead, you will use distributed erasure coding uh, to protect your data at 59s if needed with an overhead as low as 1.80. Um, 
for example, all right? Um, okay, scalability, how do we scale WAS? The cool thing about WAS is you can build your object storage cloud with just one storage node, okay? Uh, one of our customers, I think about three months back, sent me an email thanking us for how easy it was to deploy um, a WAS storage cloud in, in just 24 minutes. They unboxed our WAS storage node, they wrecked it, and they had their storage cloud up and running. 24 minutes is all what it needed. As they needed to scale, they would just add more nodes, and the system would scale just as one single system. We scale out in clusters. One cluster can contain up to 256 nodes, if, and you can combine up to 32 clusters, which will give you a total capacity of uh, just under one exabyte of data. Now about OCP, why are we here? What's so cool today? Yesterday, we heard Frank talk about um, uh, the, the, the processes of, of um, becoming OCP compliant. Well, we're very happy uh, that we're part of that. Uh, we will go through the uh, process of, of becoming OCP compliant, but we're not waiting for that. Today already, through a new partner that we can announce, Hive, we are the first object storage platform company that is, in, that is available, integrated on OCP compliant hardware. Through Hive, we are already available as an o OCP compliant solution. And the cool thing about this, um, the, this partnership is that it adds to the flexibility. Our customers can still choose to buy integrated uh, um, DDN hardware with our software all on it, very easy to wreck. But with Hive, it gives them the opportunity to go for smaller nodes, for bigger nodes, for higher density, for more compute power. Um, so here is where we are leveraging OCP and where we are enabling the OCP community to build more scalable, more efficient um, storage platforms. So the integrated Hive and DDN solution, you, you can see it on the show floor. Uh, to date, uh, the uh, H1312 is featured. In the future, we will also be uh, on the 15 series. And we're also integrated with the uh, Hive open uh, OCP open, uh, open Vault platform. The cool thing about having proprietary software that is pre-integrated with OCP hardware is that it allows you to leverage all the benefits of the OCP hardware. If you choose to put an open source technology on that hardware, the thing is, you have to do all of the integration yourself, and you're losing a lot of the benefits of that uh, OCP hardware platform. And then two final slides about us being proprietary in an open source community. So I, I, I'm sure that a lot of you guys are, are, are thinking, why are we listening to a proprietary software company? Why would we spend money on software well, there is such a wide choice of uh, open, uh, open source solutions. What you can see on there is um, a generic TCO study. It's a combination, actually, of several studies that we've done the, um, uh, based on different architectures. But what you will see there is public cloud is clearly the most expensive solution. And then if you compare um, open source software solutions to pre-integrated proprietary software and OCP hardware, you will find that in the end, your TCO is a lot lower than you will get with your uh, open source solution and the, uh, the do-it-yourself solution that we used for this calculation was Swift. Uh, and why is that? Well, the bottom, the bottom of that graph shows the hardware cost. So first of all, we're much more cost efficient on a hardware level. You, you need less hardware if you're using optimized proprietary software such as, uh, well, DDN's was. Um, Software, very tiny for do-it-yourself Swift, very clear, that's the cheapest. You will always have to integrate some extra software, so there is always some cost. But then the big difference comes on the management and the time to market. So the big chunk that you see at the top and the do-it-yourself, that is your management cost, and that is the cost of the long time to market to, to deploy open source software that is not pre-integrated on uh, OCP uh, platforms. Um, thanks to the pre-integration of WAS with Hive, your management cost is a lot lower. I had a conversation with Gartner two months ago, and we were talking about the total amount of storage that uh, one uh, full-time employee, one FTE, can manage. Their number was ridiculously low. According to Gartner, one storage manager can, can manage 180 terabyte. Let's say that they're off by factor 10. Let's say that... Um, they can manage 1.8 petabyte, say two petabyte. We've got a customer 
I can't name them, but if you come to me later on, I can tell you who it is. <laughs> uh, we've got a customer who right now are managing 20 petabyte with just one FTE. That is how we bring this cost saving. 20 petabyte by one person. They're planning to grow to, to 30 petabyte this year, and they don't see a need to add more staff. That's the cost. That, that is where your TCO gets lower with proprietary optimized software. The bottom line, however, is the choice of object storage platform should not be a pure TCO cost. You should have a look at the features. And I'm not sure if I have the time to go through all the details here, but if you take a look at that, from a scalability point of view, there is very little data on how far open source software for object storage can scale. We at DDN, we can show you that we can scale to one exabyte right now. For many of the web application providers, hundreds of petabytes and exabyte is in the near future, at least for the customers that we're talking to. Accessibility may sound funny, but choosing proprietary software can actually be more open than open source. Why is that? Because we provide this wide range of uh, protocols. We support uh, application-specific protocols. We support uh, REST HTTP. We support um, file system gateways. Uh, we have integrated applications that talk di uh, directly, directly to the storage in the back end. But when we do, we make sure that the way how your object is stored is not dependent on the application. You don't, you're not stuck to the application to get your data later on. Any application can access your data in the back end. That is how open proprietary hardware can be. Efficiency, I think I've tackled that. Reliability, the choice of data protection schemes. Um, if, if you look into the open source uh, uh, storage solutions, uh, reliability, availability, and integrity is, is, is not their strongest point. The replication schemes in, in Swift, for example, are very limited, and they're not as smart as what we have built in. And then from a performance point of view, well, I think I've shared enough about our, our HPC successes and our supercomputing experience. So I think it's uh, pretty clear that uh, if you need performance, proprietary software is still the way to go. Thank you very much.